Hi there, welcome to our Fertility and Family Building After Dobbs panel. My name is Katherine Tucker. I am a board member at Resolve New England, and I am also a fertility lawyer practicing in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So we are really excited to be presenting this panel to you today because we want to you to understand that we are there for you as you build your family post dobbs And we know that true reproductive autonomy includes controlling if, when, and how you have a pregnancy. And I think when you come out of this panel, you're going to be feeling good about how things look in New England. So I'm going to invite each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And we'll start with Dr. Andrea Pelletier. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Andrea Pelletier. I am a practicing obstetrician gynecologist in Portland, Maine, and I'm also the medical director for Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, which includes all of our sites in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Aaron Steyer. Yeah, thanks so much, Catherine. I'm Aaron Steyer. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and the co-founding partner, medical director, and practice physician at CCR in Boston Fertility in Chestnut Hill. Um, I've been in practice for over 20 years, I think now, and focus of areas of female and male infertility, um, fertility preservation, IVF, LGBTQI, fertility care, um, fertility outcomes in people of color, as well as egg donation. Uh, I myself have been a prior IVF patient about 13, 14 years ago. And been active in advocacy um, as a board member of Resolve Women as well as Fertility Within Reach. And very thankful um, and honored to be a member of this panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Steyer. And last but not least, we have attorney Ellen Trackman. Thank you for having me. I'm Ellen Trackman. I'm an attorney with a practice focused on assisted reproductive technology. So mostly surrogacy, egg sperm, and embryo donation. Uh, I also write a regular column for a national legal website called Above the Law on assisted reproductive technology legal issues, and I co-host a podcast called I Want to Put a Baby in You, where I have the honor of having um, experts and specialists in the field on, as well as lots of people who have um, fascinating personal stories about building their families or helping others build their families. Okay, fantastic. So we've got two lawyers on the panel today and two doctors. We'll see what everybody's <laughs> perspective is on these issues. Um, I'm going to direct my first question to Attorney Trackman. Can you give us a layman's summary of the Dobbs decision so we can be sure that we are all on the same page as we're discussing these issues tonight? Yes, I'm sure a review for everyone with everything that's going, been going on in our country, but Essentially, for about 50 years, our, there had been a determination by our Supreme Court that the Constitution guaranteed a right for person who, persons who are pregnant to have the ability to choose whether to terminate the pregnancy or not terminate the pregnancy. There was some nuance in that, but generally that right existed and could not be determined on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, we saw some changes in the makeup of our, of our Supreme Court and a new challenge came to Roe versus Wade, this established right to make that choice. And in the decision, in the Dobbs decision, the current Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade saying, no, that was decided incorrectly. The constitution does not provide this right. And in fact, the determination when it comes to any restrictions of abortion or terminations of pregnancy should be made on a state by state. Uh, basis. So lots of states were um, ready for this, where they had something called trigger laws, where they had a law ready to become effective if Roe was no longer considered constitutional. So the second Roe was overturned, some of these trigger laws became effective to say, now there is a abortion ban at 15 weeks or whatever the week might be or the specifics of that abortion ban. So, um, so now we're looking at state by state determinations and no constitutional protection. Okay, and let me just follow up by adding that there are no trigger laws in any of the six New England states. So we are fortunate not to be subject to those trigger laws. Um, I don't know, Dr. Pelletier or Dr. Steyer, if you wanna add anything to that. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, well, while it's changing every single day, I think we're at about 18 states that have some sort of either a total abortion ban or an extremely restrictive ban in place with several more states where um, that continues to still be at risk um, 
um, through going into next year. So um, while we're very protected in New England and very um, fortunate in that way, there are still um, women and families being impacted all over the country. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've seen predictions that they expect 26 states to have um, mm -hmm. some kind of ban in place shortly. And for, from a fertility standpoint, I think those of in my specialty worry about uh, the unexpected fallout from this, which would be applied to embryos and personhood for embryos. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that we've always said that an embryo is neither person or property. Um, but when personhood is applied to an embryo, um, that really um, limits uh, many things that can be done with an embryo, whether it be freezing, discarding, and also would ultimately uh, reduce the success rates of IVF and other fertility uh, treatments and, and essentially really um, limit reproductive autonomy like it's doing with um, the abortion side of things. And so we'll talk about those more later, but there are a lot of um, a widespread uh, array of things that could happen both on the family planning standpoint, but also from the proconception standpoint uh, with um, ART as well as uh, fertility treatments. And I just want to add in terms of New England that New Hampshire is unfortunately the one New England state that does have an abortion ban that kicks in at 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be applying to embryos and personhood for embryos. It does apply later in pregnancy and in that way it is somewhat similar to the to the way we had things structured under Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you all for your perspectives on that. I wanna to turn to our second question and I'm gonna again, turn to attorney Trackman. Focus of Dobbs has been on abortion, but we know it has implications for reproductive health care, including specifically fertility treatment more broadly. What are some of the concerns nationally going from preconception all the way through pregnancy? Yeah, a lot. So many of them. I, part of the issue is the, the decision in Dobbs really looked at a fundamental right basis of what, what can we expect our fundamental rights. And um, especially the Thomas concurrence said the basis of Roe was this right of privacy um, substantive due process, and that's not a thing. That you don't you don't get these rights. Like, and there are so many other basic rights that we enjoy that he called out and said, no, the Constitution doesn't really protect these. So, marriage equality, right to contraception, right to have consensual consensual sexual relations with who you choose, which he pointed out were not specifically named in the Constitution, but were instead interpreted as privacy rights. And along those rights are really this much broader concept of reproductive rights, not just can I terminate a pregnancy that is already established, but what can I do with embryos? Can I go through IVF in general? Do I have the ability to make a choice about my reproductive future? Um, so, so many broad elements. Um, where, where do you want me to start, Catherine? I mean, <laughs> Dr. Steyer mentioned like the ability to decide what to do with embryos, which we've already seen some limitation on in the past where Louisiana, for example, has statutorily in their law defined embryos as having, as being juridical persons and having the right to sue and be sued. So we know in states like Louisiana, you might be able to go through IVF in the state, but you cannot make the choice to discard an embryo. You have to either use it for your own conception purposes or donate to others for conception purposes. So your, your ability to choose is very limited. Of course, there is this right to travel right now, so you can move your embryos to another state, um, but we could see a number of states follow in Louisiana's footsteps and those kind of limitations. Excellent. And Dr. Steyer, can you comment on this from the perspective of a reproductive endocrinologist? Yeah, so I think the going back to Ellen's statement about Louisiana, this has been in place previously in Europe for many, many decades. And so um, the example was that you could only fertilize the number of eggs that you would transfer as embryos. And so say a woman would make, uh, would have 14 or 15 eggs retrieved, if say there was a limit of transferring two embryos into the uterus, you can only fertilize two eggs or try to fertilize two eggs or inseminates for eggs with sperm. And then the other eggs would not be utilized because you don't, you didn't want you to make any extra embryos that would either be 
frozen or subject to discard if they didn't survive the in vitro system. And so I think this opens up a lot of implications in my field. And I think one thing, you know, that I, I want to go through, maybe you want to do it now or later on, just kind of give a background of really how IVF works and really the, the assumptions that go down the line of the fact that you want to freeze embryos for future use. And also the fact that the majority of eggs and embryos would not become a live born baby. And so I think if you're looking, thinking in that situation, the whole gamut of why does, why is it so important for IVF? IVF is based upon the premise that uh, you're going to start with a higher number of eggs, a large number of eggs, a certain percent will be fertilized, become embryos, and a certain percent of those embryos will essentially grow in a um, laboratory in an incubator, and some will be available for transfer and some will not because they will stop growing because the majority of them are not really meant to become live born babies. Now, the whole issue of, you know, watching and seeing embryos not make it or not grow is a big deal because with a discard of an embryo, which ultimately probably would not have made it anyway, that could open up uh, medical legal risks to reproductive endocrinologists as part of the natural part of what you see in a culture system for embryos. I think the other thing is going to be, um, besides that, the freezing required preservation um, portion of it, in the sense that an ideal cycle involves having embryos for transfer and then having embryos that are frozen, either if that embryo doesn't work or implant, or for future child uh, building, and so family building, rather. So I think that um, with that, it also would potentially put limits on the success of IVF because we really do uh, count the fact of fertilizing as many eggs as possible, having additional embryos available uh, for transfer, whether now or in the future. Um, and also knowing that, you know, as, especially as women get older, when they get to the late 30s, early 40s, there's a higher portion of embryos that are not normal that also would not be transferable. So this all really, as Ellen said, you know, we ha have to be focused here because there's so much more, so much to talk about. There are implications um, that are unanticipated. And I think it comes from the fact that many laymen and, and lawmakers don't really understand the intrinsic assumptions of IVF and why it's so successful. Thank you so much. So I know from my perspective, I was a fertility patient for several years. I underwent six cycles of IVF. If my doctor told me that some of my eggs were not going to be fertilized and instead we throw them out, I would have been really, really angry, frustrated, disappointed. I mean, the fertility treatment process is hard enough, but to tell a patient who's been doing all these hormones, undergoing ultrasounds, undergoing retrieval surgery that, hey, yeah, too bad. We're just going to have to toss these. That would not have gone over well at all. Um, now, I, can I just ask you to comment on one more thing in terms yeah. of PGT testing? What is yeah. that and how could that be affected potentially by abortion bans? Yeah, so PGT testing, pre implantation genetic testing or PGT, there's two forms or two types. There is for, one for mutations where uh, potential parents carry... Uh, mutations in DNA or uh, genetic issues that can be passed on the, to their offspring. Um, and also there is PET for screening for aneuploid or abnormal chromosomal numbers. Now let's go to the mutations first. They'll say something like cystic fibrosis. Um, they, we had the ability over the past two decades to create embryos, uh, test them to see which embryos will, are carriers or they're affected by that disorder and then transfer the unaffected embryo into the uterus and such eliminate that risk or reduce that risk significantly to the offspring. Um, and on the other side with the aneuploidy screening, as women get older, there's a higher rate of miscarriage because there's a higher rate of issues with eggs that have abnormal chromosomes. And so with that, things like Down syndrome are higher when women get older. And that's an example of aneuploid that we're screening for. So what happens with that process is that not only are they tested, but the embers are frozen while we're waiting for the results to come back. And so there's two issues that I see here. The first one is the cryopreservation. If there is a definition of personhood, you know, that would affect the ability to freeze and to thaw because some say the ember doesn't survive the thaw. Who as who is at risk for that? And what are the legal implications of that? And the second thing is um, if the embryo is a carrier of a disorder and say the disorder is not lethal or it's not like threatening in the first year, but it has lifelong consequences such as CF, um, and that's the only embryos that are available, um, would the would legislation force a couple to transfer those in lieu of not making more embryos? 
or alternatives, say somebody did a cycle and they had all embryos that were affected or abnormal genetically, would they be able to discard the embryos that are not transferable um, per uh, you know uh, standard of care? And so I think the PGT um, aspect here, Catherine, is quite intriguing because it involves several things that could surface if we were to have personhood come into a larger light, which includes cryopreservation, preservation, which includes survival from cryopreservation preservation and thaw, but also involves uh, dis intrinsic discard of embryos that are abnormal genetically or that wouldn't be transferable. Thank you so much. That is really interesting. And I'm glad we were able to talk about the getting pregnant part of the care. But there's an another important piece, which is that after you get pregnant, we want you to have a healthy pregnancy. So I'm going to ask Dr. Pelletier if she can touch base on the impact on pregnancy care and delivery. Huge implications. I mean, we're, again, very fortunate in New England that women are still going to have access to abortion care, and that's not restricted. Um, where... Um, women and families in, in New England could start to be affected is as more stands, as more states ban abortion. Um, there could be a ripple effect where that limits access in New England. So um, right now, fortunately, because, you know, DC and New York, and there's a lot of areas surrounding New England where um, abortion access is, is abortion care is still available, that um, we've been fairly well buffered and protected, but um, areas like Boston are going to soon become a lot harder to um, get scheduled for procedures. And um, many women and families choose abortion for a variety of reasons, and often it can be for um, diagnoses that they receive during the pregnancy, especially when you get into second trimester and even later abortion care, it's usually a highly desired pregnancy where a family um, has received really pretty devastating news. Um, and as and the 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 area the places where you can get these um, second and second and sometimes third trimester abortions are very few and far between. And so as these places get more overwhelmed with volume because other areas of the country are completely limiting access, it can be harder for families in New England to get that care. Um, there are, when it comes to um, assisted reproductive technology, we think a lot about um, um, uh, excuse me, selective reduction. Sorry, I blinked on my words for a second. And there are not, a, there's not a huge list of options to travel to as far as, you know, selective reduction of a pregnancy. And if those options become even more limited because that is restricted um, due to abortion laws, that could be even more devastating for families in New England. But fortunately for, um, we haven't had to, you know, change any of our laws or make any changes due to Dobbs in New England. So we're still able to provide that care. There's just fear of the future as more states restrict access and um, wait times get longer, mm -hmm. um, what that could mean for New England families. And what about your colleagues in other states outside of New England? Have they dealt with these specific issues of treating a woman who is having a life-threatening issue during pregnancy? I know I myself had a condition, I'm going to butcher the name, hyperemesis gravidarum. Hyperemesis, right? yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, if that treatment option that was offered to me was to terminate the pregnancy. I didn't want to do mm -hmm. that. Unfortunately, I was able to respond to meds well enough to keep going. But there are things where the treatment option is terminate the pregnancy. How are your colleagues in other parts of the country that are more impacted by these abortion bans dealing with those issues? It's incredibly um, difficult and very state specific. Like there are physicians and ethicists 
Senate and lawyers sitting around and reading these laws in detail, trying to figure out how sick does someone have to be in order for me to perform their abortion. And it's just horrifying. And so um, I've heard specific examples of women with who are septic in the hospital, but they and the infection is coming from the pregnancy, but there's still a heartbeat. And the patient is not sick enough to have the abortion because they're not in the ICU yet, or they're not intubated yet. It, it's just horrifying things. Um, there was a lot of fear around ectopic pregnancy kind of going into um, the Dobbs decision. And I haven't heard as many like specific examples of um, obstetrician gynecologists not being able to treat ectopic pregnancies. I think um, most in most cases that's able to very clearly be argued that that's a non-viable life-threatening pregnancy. Um, but the fact that we even have to have these discussions is just I, completely mind boggling. To the point of a disconnect between kind of medical expertise and knowledge and legislators, I heard of draft legislation that essentially says, said if there's an ectopic pregnancy, they just need to move the embryo. Yes, to just implant it in the uterus. <laughs> Which um, I feel like you could share that is not a thing. <laughs> like not, not a thing. Right. Correct. What it underscores the whole fact of educating the legislators, legislators to understand exactly what the true core biology is of pregnancy in general. I mean, I think mm -hmm. one thing I want to ask you, Andrea, and this is you and I probably both treat failed pregnancies with mesoprostol and mifepristone. Mm -hmm. Mifepristone is RU486, the original abortion pill. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything in the rest of the country where someone, an ob or whomever prescribes RU486 which is part of the gold standard with, with mesoprostol now for pregnancy failures? Have you seen any kind of restrictions on its prescription um, in, nationally? Well, it's very hard to prescribe anyway, even yeah. without Dobbs, like it yeah. has to be dispensed from physician right. offices, right. you have to right. register with the um, pharmaceutical company. And so it's not one that anyone can just pick up yeah. at a pharmacy. Yeah. Um, there are not in, in states where there are complete abortion bans. I have not heard that that medication can't be dispensed for miscarriage gotcha. use, but I, but it's confusing. Yeah. And so even just mesoprostol, so typically medication abortion or miscarriage management is with mifepristone and mm -hmm. mesoprostol. Yeah. Um, me mesoprostol is more commonly dispensed and can be picked up at a pharmacy, mm -hmm. but I've heard stories and heard reports of pharmacies in these abortion ban states not dispensing mesoprostol because they are in fearful that they are aiding and abetting an abortion when really it's a really sad and highly like miscarriage situation and a highly desired pregnancy that needs this medication to manage it um, but and and I don't think it's always necessarily malicious I think there's also this fear of prosecution that they're breaking the law mm -hmm. um, there, I know that some of these banned states are working hard to limit access to Mickey access, Pristone. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest issue is access to larger mm -hmm. clinics. I can tell you anecdotally, I've had, you know, we mainly only use meso, uh, mesoprostol is easier to dispense. So typically, success rates are pretty mm -hmm. good when those who have failed pregnancies. Um, and I've had some patients say to me, even in New England, that they've I've been asked several questions about why are you um, obtaining this? And so, mm -hmm. of course, it's none of the the business that's only anybody but business for the patient, but it's something I've seen some pushback, especially those those of my patients who may be out of state who are filling mm -hmm. the prescription. So I just hope, obviously, all this stuff has come out of left field with Dobbs, that that uh, medication is not limited in access as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So let me follow up on that, Dr. Steyer, because I know that the stuff we've been talking about is discouraging. And we're sure that the Dobbs decision has, ca has caused a lot of stress and emotion for fertility patients. But in reality, has the Dobbs decision resulted in any changes to fertility care in the six New England states? It hasn't changed fertility care in a sense of what, how we proceed with you know, diagnostic testing, with treatment, and ultimately managing outcomes. It has changed the narrative of how we counsel patients and the questions that we get. 
And so I can tell you uh, personally that, you know, the first several weeks after Dobbs, even before that, when the leak happened, when people thought this was going to happen, occur rather, that patients essentially would call and leave portal messages asking, okay, I have embryos stored at CCR in Boston. Are they stored in Boston? Or are they stored somewhere else on offsite? That was the first thing that came up. And luckily, all of our embryos are stored here on site, Chestnut Hill. And then the second thing is they would ask, well, if I were to go to another state that would be a trigger law state, what would occur? And so I said, I don't know at this point in time, it's still an emerging and evolving process. I also have some former patients of mine who have moved to trigger law states who have elected to, to, to they've had their, their baby or babies, and they've come back to me over the past six months or past couple of months rather to do their care in Boston. So they'll come up here for about two weeks to their IVF and then go back knowing that this is more IT where a safe haven, more of a predictable environment, you know, for them. And so it definitely has changed the questions that we get, um, the the amount of reassurance that we're providing. Um, that was it was a lot more um uh, more volume back when the decisions came down. But also some of my patients who have moved to these states that have more aggressive laws towards anti-abortion legislation um, have elected to go to states uh, such as you know New York or Boston with CCRMs where they could have treatment where they know that there probably is a lower risk for um, any kind of um, laws that would affect their outcomes or affect their autonomy with IVF. And I'm just curious, are you seeing increased um, choice for PGT or other testing? In order for especially those in trigger state or other states with with bans or restrictions to reduce the chance that they might need to turn to a termination or abortion? That's a great question, Ellen. Um, because at the end of the day, we know that PGT in specific populations may reduce the, the risk of miscarriage. Um, I think it's so early, I think that study has not been the data has not looked at, but that'd be a very interesting question to um explore more because especially in these states where there may be more of a, a challenge, especially with managing a miscarriage or, or a pregnancy that say had a chromosome issue, but could result in a live birth, but be impacted after delivery. So I think it's something that, you know, myself, my colleagues, the ASRM just look closely at and hopefully, uh, you know, support, um, you know, analysis in the future. And a slightly, um, different question, but similar. Um, I've seen a huge increase in requests for tubal sterilization hmm. um, and vasectomy because people that may have considered abortion before as part of their fertility plan, they're concerned that it might not be an option. So even in um, uh, people who have chosen to not have children and they're just wanting to make that more surgical permanent choice now because they're worried about their future options. Makes sense. Hmm. Good information. I'm going to ask attorney Trackman um, from the legal perspective, um, what are you seeing lawyers in other states, especially states with the abortion bans doing? Yeah, related to, <laughs> related to, to part. which part, which of the hundred parts, right? <laughs> related to their their clients that are undergoing fertility care and treatment in other states. Yeah, I mean, I think we see it come up in a number of contexts. So, like these questions of what can I do to reduce the chance I'm put in this position where I'm having to travel to another state to access care or um, face really difficult questions about my rights or abilities. Um, I know that you uh, specifically asked about surrogacy later, but I don't know if you want me to bring that up already, but I mean, even decisions about um, if you have to turn to a surrogate, who you might want to work with and what state she's located in might be an important decision now, or even more so than it was five months ago because of the different laws. You know, when it comes to a surrogacy arrangement, the question of a potential termination of a pregnancy or abortion is already such a sensitive topic where your child, her body, her health, such a balancing of rights. Um, before you already had those complications and issues, but now it's a bigger complication of if you guys are all on the same page that it's in an unfortunate situation where you need to look at a termination of pregnancy, she may not have access to that 
in her state. And now we're looking at her traveling. And if you're in a state, if she's coming from a state where if you're helping her travel, are you aiding and abetting? Are you at risk of liability? Is your attorney, is your agency? So really spreading that risk and liability to, to all parties involved as well. So it really has increased those conversations in terms of making those decisions and what level of risk you're comfortable with. Thank you. And I know, you know, from my perspective, and I, I'm sure you, you too, we used to counsel our, our clients, you cannot force your surrogate to terminate the pregnancy, and you can't stop her from terminating the pregnancy. Um, that still remains to, true in New Hampshire, because our surrogacy legislation specifically provides for that. But in terms of other states, what, you know, do we know the answer? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that we can generally understand that in most that you know in any state there is this like bodily autonomy that the police are not going to like force you or stop i mean they're not going to force you from terminating or force you to terminate even in a state that permits it right but the opposite becomes much bigger an issue that should you choose that you want a termination do you have access to it are you at risk of liability are you going to have to travel to another state to be able to access that kind of care and what kind of risk are you putting yourself at? I mean, not only the ability to travel, but we're also seeing, I'm sure you might know this as well, but um, increasing wait times in states, especially when it's, you know, states that have bans and they're next to a state that might permit it. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing kind of a population having to seek care in another state. And even those who might be in the state that's friendly are having to wait longer to access care if they need a termination. So, I mean, both for people in red or termination states that are that, where there's bans and those who are in friendly states near them might be affected in their ability to access care, especially in terms of wait, wait times. So, and let me ask you this. I know in the Dobbs decision, they said, don't worry about, you know, traveling to other states. You can still travel to other states and have your abortion there. Do you feel confident that that's going to be the rule going forward? I mean, we're hopeful, right? But we, in addition to those, we've certainly seen those states who are trying to protect the right to access care taking further steps. That we're seeing, you know, governors saying, also we will protect, you know, any kind of not non enforcement of a case against you in our state um, to try to protect within their borders the ability they can. Um, you know, the right to travel is a constitutionally protected right right now. Um, but you know, when when Justice Thomas and these and these other justices are like, hey, it's not directly written that there is a right to abortion. It's also not directly written that there is a right to travel. So, you know, a lot of these well established rights have really be, you know, become less stable and less certain. Okay, and so let's turn back to New England, where we have a much more positive landscape. And I'm going to ask Dr. Pelletier to address this. We have had several New England states that have passed or proposed policy changes to protect access to reproductive health care, including abortion, since the Dobbs decision. Can you tell us about some of these? So um, I am less familiar with the actual legislation, but I know Vermont has now basically codified the right to abortion um, in I believe it's part of their constitution, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't remember the, <laughs> the legal terminology, but they did vote on, so on um, protecting the right to abortion in Vermont. Um, and no specific legislation in Maine was passed. And I'm less familiar with what is specifically going on um, in New Hampshire, but Basically, not a whole lot has changed as far as the abortion access landscape. Everyone who is providing care is still doing um, the care that they've been providing. Excellent. Um, and I'll just share that in Massachusetts, there was a uh, reproductive health bill passed this past summer, which included critical pr uh, protections for those in mass who provide or help someone access reproductive health care. Um, so that um, we've got some protections, some pretty broad protections down in mass, 
where actually folks from around the country have been looking at that as a model to bring to their states. So I think we're yeah. in pretty good shape in mass. Um, I don't know if Dr. Steyer or Attorney Trackman want to comment on this. Yeah, I mean, I think Catherine just underscored the fact that most people know that mass has the most comprehensive, one of the most longstanding fertility mandate bills, bills in the United States. And so it makes perfect sense. You know, over four decades ago, a small group of, uh, of patients and people felt so strong that it went to, uh, you know, the legislation and we had this law passed. And it's, it's an essential part. I feel one of, the, one of the threads of DNA in mass is this fertility mandate that we have and we enjoy. And so, it, you know, I think here, especially everybody is so much more progressive about understanding that, you know, despite what may happen in the level of the Supreme Court, um, in the Commonwealth here, um, there's certain things that we see as things that are not negotiable. And that Im includes the right to uh, either not become a parent or to become a parent. And also, I think the other thing is going to be really um, the ability and access to uh, or the path to parenthood through fertility treatments as needed. And so I think, you know, thank goodness in this area, whether it be Mass, Rhode Island, who have the most active mandates and applications, um, insurers as well as uh, employers appreciate that or are educated about this. And uh, I feel confident that these will not um, be impacted adversely in any way. Excellent. Not to bring us outside New England again, but every state that had abortion on the ballot in the midterm elections mm -hmm. um, voted to support abortion protection. Mm -hmm. um, and even like pre the midterms, Kansas being a huge red state, yeah you know, overwhelming support to keep abortion legal. So everywhere it was on the ballot, um, lots of support for maintaining abortion access everywhere. Excellent. And that abortion access also leads to fertility treatment access. So that is good news. Um, I want to change our focus a little bit because at Resolve New England, we support family building, be it via fertility treatment or, or via adoption. We support both types. So we've been talking a lot about fertility treatment and especially IVF, but we haven't talked about adoption. So I'd like to kind of turn and talk about that. The Supreme Court justices seem to indicate that they contemplate that adoption is a great alternative to abortion and that there may be more babies available for adoption if abortion is less readily accessible. So I'm going to ask Attorney Trackman first to address this. Does that comport with what we know about decision making of pregnant women? Yeah, I mean, we understand from like a logical sense that that sounds kind of right, that if people are wanting an abortion and they're, they don't have access and they might choose adoption. But one of, you know, one very interesting study that's often referred to the turnaway study showed that wasn't as accurate as people might be thinking or perceiving it to be. And in that study where specifically they were following women who sought an abortion were denied an abortion and what happened going forward. And in that case, it was I believe less than 9% that, that chose the adoption path that for most pregnant persons, it's not a choice between abortion and adoption. It's a much more complicated decision that if I am going to have this child, it isn't just I'll give it up or I will go through an adoption process that can be much more complicated. And we see that that decision making tends to lean towards even those people who are not in a good position to be able to parent, choosing to try to parent. And another part of the turnaway study was really following the effects and the harms on those parents, those families where we saw a significant increase in poverty, a significant increase in um, exposure to violence, being in violent relationships, unable to, to leave those relationships. Um, so lots of negative effects. It wasn't people choosing no abortion, okay, adoption, everything's fixed. But th those weren't the choices being made and we don't really expect that that will be the outcome in these states where abortion isn't an, isn't an option. And Dr. Pelletier, do you wanna comment on that? Ber uh, via your experience with Planned Parenthood? Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
I agree with everything that um, Ellen said. Hello. And the other um, thing that we know from studying Texas and SB8, which happened, was it a couple summers ago with the, um, basically the heartbeat ban. So restricting abortions um, after six weeks. Um, when they actually studied what happened with those patients who sought abortion and didn't get abortion, about 50% continued the pregnancy and 50% traveled to get their abortion. And so we don't know with, that was one state. So we don't know with Dobbs and the restriction being in so many states, if it's still gonna be that 50% um, continue those pregnancy rates. But um, I think um, we're all concerned about um, seeing similar results to the Turnaway study and just keeping um, women and families in poverty, in poverty and, um, um, continuing to provide those uh, barriers for them. And I'll just add, you know, from my legal perspective, okay, that it's not just so easy as, oh, I'm, I want to place my baby for adoption. I'm going to do it. There are laws in place, and those laws allow a birth father to stop an, adop mm -hmm. an adoption from happening. So it's not just the birth mother's decision about what's going to happen. There are laws and other people involved in the whole process that need to be considered. Um, just say from the flip side as well, you know, when we're looking at access to, to IVF, access to reproductive choices from the other side of wanting to be a parent. Um, so to talk about my podcast briefly, we did this great interview with this attorney, Lila Bradley, who essentially was busting the adoption myth where people will often tell those going through fertility, just adopt that there's, there's babies waiting. And she really goes into detail about how it's not true. There aren't just like healthy babies waiting for you to adopt them. It's much more complicated, much more difficult than that. You know, the percentage of people who change their mind, the ability to, to be on these wait lists, you know, international adoption is very, very difficult that those other art options aren't really a just do this. They are also very complicated and very difficult. Um, you know, getting into that, uh, you know, I want to talk that talk about this concept of it not being just the woman who is involved in fertility treatment. There are generally going to be two patients, the female patient and the male patient. How do you, you know, how do we think about the rights of the male patients in, you know, kind of in the way that we're thinking about the rights of birth fathers? Um, when it comes to these issues. And I think, you know, what, just to be a little more clear, I think where I'm getting at is, I know, um, Attorney Trackman, that you recently presented at ASRM about frozen embryo disputes between couples. That's something that is the rights, not just of the woman who's pregnant. There's nobody pregnant. They've got frozen embryos. The woman and the man have equal rights. What, talk about those. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating area of what happens when, there are two people, they provide their genetic material to form an embryo, and they cannot agree on the future of that embryo, whether it should be used for reproduction, have um, being born into this world or not. And I would say pre-Dobbs, we really saw a very strong legal trend that when it comes to this constitutional right to determine whether you reproduce or not, there was a very strong feeling that a person had the right not to reproduce, meaning often in the case, it was frequently a man who would say, I do not want those embryos being used. I do not want another person conceiving with my genetic material because you know, there are concerns about me having a genetic person who I may or may not be raising, or I do not wanna have another child. And there was a lot of cases of embryo disputes where the court ruled the right not to reproduce was a protect protectable right. Um, there were few exceptions to that, a couple of cases where in the dispute, the person wanting to reproduce had no other means to become a genetic or biological parent, and those embryos were her only remaining option. And those cases, the judge did lean towards the ability to reproduce. But other than those exceptions, we really saw this like right not to reproduce being protected. Um, 
in some of those cases, so there's one in Missouri, for example, where Missouri has a statute that defines embryos as persons. And it's very clear, like any form, you know, the very beginning, the fertilization of an egg, that is a person. And in that case, you know, the, the person wanting to reproduce is like, look at our statute. This is a person. I have a right to reproduce. I need to bring this embryo to life. And the man not wanting to reproduce, he looked to the U.S. Constitution saying, the U.S. Constitution says, I have a reproductive right to not reproduce. And the Missouri statute was overruled by the judge ruling for the U.S. Constitution and the right not to reproduce. But after Dobbs, that right becomes much more questionable, the right mm -hmm. not to reproduce. And I know, Catherine, you saw the ASRN talk where I mentioned this law in Arizona <clears throat> where it was a law was passed in Arizona that says that a divorcing couple that appears before a court in Arizona, that judge is not permitted to go by any decision they may have signed before. So if they sign consent forms together that says, in the case of divorce, embryos are discarded or embryos go to the female partner. It says, no, the judge must ignore all of those. They must specifically rule in a way that um, determines that the person most likely to bring the embryos to birth must receive them. And prior to Dobbs, we would have said that is definitely unconstitutional. That is against the reproductive rights and the reproductive choice of these parties to make those decisions for themselves. And now that we've really thrown into question what kind of protection the Constitution provides us, you know, that statute is still on the books and less likely to be determined unconstitutional. So it sounds like what we really need is clarity, clarity from the courts, clarity from the legislatures. Um, we just had our midterm elections. Results are still trickling in, but we have a pretty good sense of who is going to be um, serving in each state in New England. And so I guess we should talk about how the midterm election results are going to impact reproductive health care in New England. And I'll start with New Hampshire. We our governor was reelected. He has been a very fertility friendly governor. He has signed our infertility insurance coverage bill into law. And, you know, we see a lot of um, we've, we've had a lot of bipartisan support for infertility related laws here in New Hampshire. So I think we're in a pretty good place in New Hampshire. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Steyer if he could talk about Massachusetts. I think Massachusetts probably is going to be still in, a, in good shape as well. I think that, you know, the overwhelming four decades of, of you know, just precedent of, uh, you know, really procreative um, choice and, and reproductive autonomy, I think will still stay with Mara Hill will come in. I think it'll, that won't change. If anything, they'll probably, uh, hopefully there will be uh, an increased push in support of LGBTQI um, uh, family building, which also we'll talk about a little bit later, could be compromised if personhood was applied to embryos. Um, but I think, I, you know, looking at where we are right here um, in Massachusetts, I think if anything, um, you know, nothing will change. And I think if anything, certain aspects of autonomy for certain specific groups may improve, hopefully will improve. Excellent. And I think that you bring up a really important point because for a same a male same-sex couple, their only option yeah. for procreation is going to yeah. be gestational surrogacy. Right. They're going to have frozen embryos. In and, order and, and, donor, and donor egg as well. So, you know, I think, you know, we can talk about this later, but I think if you think about with the whole, there's a personhood legislation applied that affects cryopreservation preservation and affects several different groups. I always look at fertility care hopefully as being accessible and inclusive. With something like that, it becomes, it, it goes to cause some type of exclusion, which essentially would affect, for instance, women who are undergoing breast cancer chemotherapy or planning for that. They want to freeze their eggs or freeze their embryos if they have a partner that may be in jeopardy if they can't freeze embryos. Um, you have uh, married female couples, couples who want to do reciprocal IVF, where one wants to carry the pregnancy and wants to produce the eggs, but sometimes you have to freeze the embryos in between to, to have that happen and sync up. So that's one other option that may, that could be affected. And as you brought it up too as well, um, Catherine, uh, I take care of a fair amount of male couples and they need to have, you know, a just carrier as well as an egg donor. And what typically happens because it's such a long list for carriers 
they will find their donor uh, quickly, usually within three to six months, uh, create embryos with their sperm and then have embryos frozen. And then later, as they go through the path, it may take a year, year and a half, they will find a carrier and then they can do the transfer. But that, that's been typically what the model's been. But now with personhood in question here are coming to the forefront, that could also be impacted as well. Um, one thing I want to bring up, Alan brought up a great point about, she really brought the point about, you know, intent to procreate. And I look at it that way. And when you're looking at these cases, really, it came down initially to when we couldn't freeze embryos was really when we could just freeze sperm. And so you had these cases of men who were, you know, on a ventilator about to pass away and their wives wanted to extract sperm emergently because they wanted to have a child, although the husband didn't consent. And so it's been, you know, we, we use this as the historical cases then applied to our current um, consent forms, um, which, you know, we always look at consent forms as some type of legal contract, but in, in effect, they're not anymore, as you point out, Ellen, it's just a piece of paper they sign with their intentions. But as you know, life changes, things change. And I think from my standpoint, you asked before about how this Dobbs ruling changed my practice. Now, hearing what Ellen's saying, it does change practice in the sense that I'm much more careful about making sure there's consensus and a couple comes to see me about procreating, about getting pregnant, about creating embryos together. I have some people who I think more casual say, well, we want to we want to make embryos now. We're not sure if we want to get pregnant in like three years or five years. And I say, well, thank you for you know sharing that. I want to understand better where you are in your relationship and understanding that making embryos or creating embryos, freezing embryos is much more complex than freezing eggs, for instance, which can be, become embryos in the future. So I think, Ellen, you, brought up, uh, you triggered just something in my mind about that, because that definitely is something that I really step back and change in my counseling, especially of uh, couples that are not married, who are dating um, for several years, but not completely committed to um, a family, but they're, 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 they, they want to get go that direction, and they, they talk about egg freezing or um, embryo banking or IVF embryo banking. And in many cases, because egg freezing in specific spaces such as here has uh, great, great uh, success rates, many times they'll do the egg freezing, hopefully to avoid if something downstream were to happen where there was a breakup or there was a discord um, that we wouldn't get in those situations. So I think from an RE standpoint, these are things I think some of my colleagues start thinking about more and more because Dobbs has completely changed all the ground rules of what consents me anymore. And if I can kind of build off of that, you mentioned working with LGBTQ um, couples and persons in the community, and they have certainly unique issues as well, including what we're seeing is an increasing amount of legal discrimination, mm -hmm. where especially those who, when we look at same-sex female couples who are married, and the law generally presumes that a parent, you know, a person who gives birth and a person married to that person who gives birth are both legal parents. And so for many, they see those presumptions, they know they're both on the birth certificate, and they're like, okay, we're good. And then we're seeing that that's actually, that's not true, that there's been case after case in Oklahoma, one that made it to the Idaho Supreme Court, another one came out in New Mexico recently, where judges are saying, no, the non-biological mother, we don't consider you a legal parent, even though you were on the birth certificate and had presumptions, and that you really need to be taking another, make, taking more steps to have a higher level yes. of protection. So getting a court order, either through a step-parent adoption, confirmatory adoption, parentage order, in order to have full faith and credit that every state will recognize you as a legal parent, especially as we see Justice Thomas saying, oh, you know, Obergefell was wrongly decided and marriage equality shouldn't be a thing that you really do want to be looking at these risks, talking to attorney, seeing if it makes sense to take another step to protect your family. And that's a great point, Ellen, because I have a lot of patients I see who do reciprocal IVF for female couples. And so think about it this way, the person delivering the child is a biologic mother. However, you can have the genetic mother who donated her eggs and it's in her wife but essentially the biologic mother is recognized more than genetic one who has the same genes as the, as the offspring. And so it's such an irony that, you know, you really have to be thinking about taking precautions, especially if you move to a state um, outside of Massachusetts or outside of New England, which doesn't recognize exactly, you know, how that arrangement works. So I think this definitely does, I think as a practitioner, um, make many of us 
more cognizant of these, um, you know, uh, more complex arrangements, whether it be male couples, whether it be reciprocal IVF, whether it be other LGBTQ um, arrangements to make sure that all parties hopefully are protected as much as possible, um, you know, moving forward. And it's, it's funny because I, sorry, that case, that situation you mentioned, especially re reciprocal IVF. Yes. I mean, there was a case a few years ago out of Michigan where same-sex couple, not married, mm -hmm. went through reciprocal IVF, had beautiful twins together, raised mm -hmm. those twins together for many years successfully. But when they split and end up in a custody, you know, affairs before the court, uh, a court said, no, one of you is not a legal parent. And even when I talk to other attorneys in this area, they're like, hmm, which one? Because it can really go either way. Either way, yeah. And in that case, they said, oh, the, the person who gave birth, you were a surrogate, you weren't yeah. a parent, which is you know crazy. But that's what we're seeing is that judges make these crazy determinations sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting when I have couples who mention it or describe that they want to consider that option, and I mentioned the legal um, ramifications and things they should be doing. They look at me, why I like, why would we do this? And then when I explained to them what you just said about the Michigan case and the things like that, they said, oh, okay. I mean, I think people who live here are, wouldn't think that ever happened anywhere else. But remember, because a lot of these things supersede how quickly the law has caught up or not caught up really, um, you know, you really have to be cautious because you may not, you may be living somewhere else in 10 or 15 years that may not really have a firm uh, protection of this type of arrangement. So that's another thing I think, you know, besides the fertility preservation part of embryo banking and a, and a couple that may not be married yet, or even that they are married, um, would be a same-sex couple who are looking at reciprocal IVF as well. And, you know, I think the good news in New England is that we have confirmatory adoptions available in mm -hmm. all six New England states. So mm -hmm. we can protect those couples yeah. legally. The reciprocal IVF, the female couples, we can protect you. You just need to come to us and we can help you, you know, do the legal pieces to make sure you're protected. So we have good laws in New England. What can people do to help keep it this way? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I mean, there are some amazing organizations that are doing really good and powerful work um, and getting involved is so important. You know, one voice, one person can make such a difference and then together, even more so. If you have time to donate, if you have a story you're willing to share, if you have money you're willing to give, <laughs> all can be incredibly powerful to influence, um, to get those stories told, to get voices heard, to make sure the law is reflecting and, you know, understanding and hearing those of, you know, the people who are affected. Catherine, do you want to name some organizations that you <laughs> feel specific? Yeah, of course, Resolve New England. Yes, we are yeah. here for folks who are residing in New England. We are here to help. If you are outside of New England, Resolve is an excellent organization. ASRM, you've heard us mention that, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Fertility Within Reach, which is actually a national organization, but they're based out of Massachusetts. These are organizations that we can work with. And then I also want to mention um, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. Mm -hmm. They're looking for stories. I recently shared my story with them and it ended up some getting published in the newspaper. And I'm very proud that I was able to do that, but they're looking for more stories. So that's a place that you can share your story, but we definitely want to see you get involved. Whatever your comfort level is with advocacy, whatever your comfort level is with sharing your story, we can help you. Just We can make it quick, easy, and convenient for you. We just need you to reach out to us and we can talk about how we can make that happen. So I want to thank our panelists today. I think we've had an excellent session. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.